Okay, and you're very welcome along to a special Talking History podcast with the one and only historian, Dr. Joe Kelly. We've all been devastated by the recent events in Chrysler, a terrible tragedy that uh, killed 10 people and injured many more. And we send our love and support as people continue to process the events and try to move forward with their lives as best they can. The people of Chrysler and its surrounds have come together and rallied to support each other through these difficult times. And I suppose that sense of community and strength is built uh, on the area's past. With that in mind, we're going to delve into the history of Chrysler. And as I say, I'm delighted to welcome on to the podcast, uh, Dr. Joe Kelly. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Greg. And uh, just to concur with what you said, you know, we have this had this recent tragedy that has cast a dark shadow over Chrysler and the surrounding communities. And in a way, it's sad that it's taken this tragedy for us maybe to realise what has been there in Chrysler for generations. Um, there's a very rich spirit and history and tradition in Chrysler uh, for generations, and it's a legacy based on family and on faith. And I believe that that legacy is what's going to rebuild Chrysler in these dark times. And when this event that has happened uh, is a sign to history, uh, Chrysler will still remain. And I believe it is that what is there now will help them rebuild that tradition of family, of faith, of community, and um, that we're very, very proud of the people of Chrysler in, in the steps that they're taking at the moment and trying to recover. Indeed, uh, join with you in that. Um, Chrysler, the name, in, in previous conversations we've had, uh, Joe, we've talked about the importance of names, of places. Tell us about Chrysler as a name. Well, Chrysler, uh, in Irish, there, there are seven deadly sins, and, and one of them would be uh, Chrys. Chrys is, is gluttony. Um, but um, in the sense of crease, law is lake, so a kind of the greedy lake, a lake that would seem to be bottomless, that you could keep filling it and it would never be filled, so a very, very deep lake. So that's what the, the meaning of the word crease means. Some might translate to crease as a trope because the food would go down your throat, crease la, um, uh, throat lake. But traditionally it would be known as uh, the greedy lake or the, the endless bottomless lake. Uh, they're just on the way into Chrysler. So that'll be the Chrysler. And then it's in the parish of Clon, the uh, Horky, Clune meaning meadow, um, uh, like uh, Clon Mani, Clune Mani, uh, the monk's meadow. Well, Clune the Horky would believe to be is the meadow of a saint called Cork, C O R C. So this the meadow of the Saint Cork. And it extends from Dunfanaghy to Chrysler. That is the St. Michael's parish area. Um, and that's what we would know. We'd be the neighbouring parish in Cahanili, and then Kel McCrennan would be on the on the other side. So that's the meaning of, of Chrysler and then the parish name as well. OK, so let's talk a, a little bit about uh, some of the very well-known and, and hugely successful and influential people that either, I suppose, came from Chrysler or, or spent time there, Joe. Well, there you could put it nearly into two categories. Firstly, there's the people from Chrysler themselves and then people that would have frequented or visited Chrysler and the surrounding areas, um, particularly with, with, with the area of um, uh, Marble Hill and you'd Law's house there, we'll talk later, later about him, and then you had the Mullins house there in Port Nabla. So and you had the train station also in Chrysler from 1903 on, so people would have been able to come in and they would have travelled through Chrysler and stayed within the community. So there's a terrible long list of famous people. Well, come here, let's start then with Bridie Gallagher, because Bridie Gallagher is Chrysler's Daniel O'Donnell, if Daniel O'Donnell's Donegal's Daniel O'Donnell. Yeah, well, yeah, she, she was the, um, well, you could say, the first female pop star, Irish pop star. Um, she really took off about 19... 50s, late 50s, 56, 57. Um, the girl from Donegal, she was known by, you know, and um, she'd done a lot of different recordings of different songs. Yeah, Mother's Love's a Blessing, The Boys from County Armagh. I mean, she, she filled audiences um, to capacity. I think it was the uh, Lawton Palladium and, and the Albert Hall. I think there were 7,500 in attendance. I don't know if that's been beaten, but it was at the time it was the biggest uh, capacity cr crowd ever in, the, in that hall. So she, she obviously had something of, of a natural talent of singing and her personality. And in 2000, the people of Chrysler honoured her. There's a, a lovely plaque as you go into Chrysler commemorating her memory. Uh, she died in 2012. And the, I know that only Gall County Council also had a, um, a story or a, a connection with her and had a civic reception for her as well. 
So um, that's that's the the girl from Donegal, yeah, and and the famous song, the homes of Donegal. She does a lovely version of that. So that'll be Brady, yeah. Yeah, and still uh, ever popular on um, Spotify. I ran just to to see what kind of traction she still has. God uh, rest her soul. She's gone some time now, but still, you know, tens of thousands of people listening to her work on this new Spotify platform. And you could argue, really, if you wanted to go right back to the very beginnings of how we could end up with Spotify, you have to go back to the very first computers and Kay McNulty worked on the first computer Kay's a lady that we've spoken to uh, we've spoken about on this uh, segment on the 9 till noon show before Joe yeah well Kay was a very very interesting woman and you know it's funny how history plays uh, with events her father would have been in jail during the war of independence he was seen as being involved in the IRA and a threat so he was jailed and when he was released then in 1924 they headed to Philadelphia um, and she then, because she went to Philadelphia, she would have had a, got an education that many at the time wouldn't have had. Um, and she ended up graduating in college. And then she goes to work on this, uh, what they call ENIAC, E-N-I-A-C, Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. Really was the first type of computer in the world. Um, and uh, the ladies hadn't been given any recognition for that. Um, they, they, um, they had been kind of ignored that they were working on this here. They were trying to figure out the trajectories of missiles and where they would land and how they could calculate this for in a war situation. And she was drafted into the Aberdeen military base in Maryland, along with four other ladies, to work on this computer. Um, so she, she then later married the man that made the computer, John uh, Mulcahy, uh, and she ended up leaving that job and helping him prepare the software for that computer. Um, so again, she was to the fore, obviously a very intelligent, very bright woman. Um, and in Netter Kenny, they have a, in the IT there, you now the Atlantic University, Technical University, they have a, a scholarship in her memory. And in fact, even nationally, uh, DCU have a building named after her, uh, the K. McNulty building. So again, a, a woman from Chrysler um, and a very, very famous woman that had achieved a lot in science. And another famous woman from Chrysler was a Mary Call. Maybe people don't know much about her, but she immigrated to, Amer uh, to Australia during the assisted migration program in the 1850s, 60s, actually organized by a priest from uh, Dontali there in Chrysler, Father McFadden, who was the parish priest of Godahar, Clohanili at the time. And rather than... Um, giving money to, because of charitable needs to people that were poor they paid for them to go to australia in an assisted migration program and she ended up being on one of these boats she came from Derry fad and she ended up marrying this man by the name of thomas kern who was a very wealthy man and uh, he later became an mp and his son was thomas kern as well and he became an mp for ireland and, and he became an mp in donegal um, and serving five years here in Donegal. So there's a, a connection of an immigrant again with Chrysla. So we've uh, mentioned the arts, obviously, um, the politics, you know, the science element of it, and also within the arts, uh, poet and writer Neil Magilla Vrija. Tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, well, obviously, I, I would have a great love for the story of Neil Magilla Vrija, um, and I, I've read some of his, most of his writings. He was, a, um, by all accounts, a lovely man who was really passionate about the culture, the language and heritage of our country. And, you know, that's still to be found in Creaseland. We still have a guilt that there in Glass. And uh, I'm very proud to have uh, that connection always with the language in Neil McGill region. He was made famous probably because of his um, refusal to put his name on English on the cart. He wrote it in the Irish script, the Irish alphabet, Neil McGill of Regia, And he was stopped by the RIC um, it was like a chassis number or a plate number of, of the time and he had written in Irish and uh, he was uh, taken to court and the case actually went to, to Dublin to the High Court and Patrick Pierce was his representative in that court, court case but he was still found uh, guilty for not having it in, in legible English writing on it. Um, and he was willing to go to jail, but somebody paid the fine for him, and he wasn't too happy about that. But that would be Neil McGill of Region. He wrote a lot of poems and stories. But one of my favourite is Mokrobogig Bon Crocketee. And I just maybe read it now. It's a lovely, beautiful rhythm to it. It's on me a challenge in year, and a fellow looked full of a guy, a mass and girl glanced at your connell, a match of a yes share file. Had door in your car and re a fall is not stormy in a boy. 
mo khoni bog hene jir khanal mo kro bog ig bon krokati and i think at this moment increased how true that is it's many is a uh, fine place in ireland according to the poets and the scholars but there's nowhere as nice as uh, at Bon Crocketty, which is a townland in Creesley, there's nowhere in the world as nice as it. And I would give all, if you offered me all the money of the King of England and all his gold and his big room of gold, I wouldn't swap it to be living at Bon Crocketty. Beautiful poem, beautiful. There's a lovely song there. And you know, it's, it is still true. If you look up at Creesley and the muckies up behind it, it's absolutely beautiful, the landscape. Yeah, it truly is. Uh, and just before we move on then, I mean, are we into tenuous link territory here now? Because we're not talking about American billionaire Doris Duke. We're talking at, about her butler. What's the connection there? Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, Doris Duke was a she was an American tobacco heiress, um, and she was very kind of philanthropy and very very good woman. But she'd been left a lot of money. I think it was one point two billion, um, and uh, she 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 uh, had a, a, a butler by the name of Bernard Lafferty who came from Chrysler in nineteen eighty seven, uh, and then when she died, she died in nineteen ninety three. She left um, uh, about five million to himself to to Bernard, and also. Uh, a sum of half a million dollars a year for the rest of his life. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Bernard uh, didn't live terribly long. He died when he was 51 in 1996. So there was a story there and a connection there. And there's often been intrigue as to what happened. But he seemed to, biographies that are written about uh, Doris Duke, that this uh, Bernard, Bernard seemed to have had a great care for for, for um the, the, he was a butler, but cared very much for Doris, and his life was, you know, resolved around her, or yeah. he revolved around her. Sorry, and, and it seems was, that was yes, reciprocated yes. then, if not during her life, certainly after. Yeah, and there was questions over the will and all that kind of stuff. But she, she was very good to him, and I think she knew the man for what he was, uh, in the sense that he, he was very good to her and caring for her. Um, and unfortunately, his his life was cut short. Mm. But yeah, that was that was he was a well known at the time and it was probably a lot of world media how, how the billionaire left money to an, a, a man from Chrysler yeah there you go um we've talked about the viaduct train disaster uh, in 1925 again previously uh, during our history uh, chats on the nine till noon show what is the the story and connection there yeah, well, again, unfortunately, there's been a sad moment in previous times in Creasle as well. And that was um, Bridget's Day or the eve of Bridget's. That had been the 31st of January, 1925. And the, the train track was opened in 1903 and stayed open to the 1946 around that time. But in 1925, on Bridget's Eve, 31st of January, the train was coming across the viaduct, the own carol viaduct, and, and the pillars are still there to be seen. And actually, I think two years ago, there was a monument erected to, the, to the, this memory of the viaduct disaster. But as the, the train was leaving the viaduct, um, um, it was about seven o'clock in the evening when the train had left Letter Kenny, and it was leaving across the viaduct and almost over it from the raw, the one picked up and it lifted the second carriage. Um, there were bread carriages and passenger carriages on it. I think 13 passenger carriages were on it. Um, and unfortunately, the roof was blown off and four of the passengers fell out of the carriage down off the, the viaduct onto, onto the ground and were killed. Um, a, husband, a husband and wife, Philip and, and Sarah Boyle from Iron Moor, and there was an Una Mulligan for Cara Connection, family still there, and a Neil Dugan there from Creasla. So unfortunately, they were they were they were uh, they were tragically killed in that in that event in 1925. So what as you're you driving then in, say past Terman, and you're driving in, and there's some very obvious sort of what looks like the supports of bridges there alongside of the road. You almost drive through or under them. Is it in that area, or uh, that uh, presumably is the same track? Yeah, almost there. That's the track, almost at the end of that viaduct. And if you go up to the top of the hill there, just as you're heading into Crista and turn to your left, there's a, there's a little monument there to commemorate the people uh, that died. Yeah, that's you've got the location. Yeah, that's, And that would have been, uh, obviously, you know, a great loss for the community at that time. But presumably, you know, a, a rail crash is going to get an awful lot of interest nationally. Ah, yeah, it would have been, and again, because of the, the loss that was ha happening mm. there as well. And, and one needs to remember that the infrastructure necessarily of roads weren't, wasn't as good as it is today, so access was important via the tra tra train. The road, actually, that we use now going into Creasa from Netterkenny, going into Ch uh, Chirlin in that direction, wasn't built in the 1837. Right. So the old road actually went up over Lost Soft, 
and round into Lacker Bridge, into Glen, into Lacker Bridge, and then up on through Dontally and up into Creasla. And that was built by a William Ray from Ards. He was the landlord in Ards, and he built the uh, that road. And what he used to do is have cattle waiting at um, at Kilmer Crennan because the horses wouldn't be able to go over up Law Salt with a heavy load. So he'd have bullocks or cattle waiting slower pace, and they would traverse the, the mountain and come down. And he would see them on the spy um, glass, or the, the, he probably had some kind of telescope, and he could see them from Ards, and he would know it would take them four hours from the point he would see them until they would arrive at Ards. My so word. he would tell the people, have food ready in four hours, and he would know how many people were coming. So yeah. far, how far then on the Letterkenny side of the N56 would be that relatively new? Certainly not as far back as what would be the turnoff to the back of Ergil Road now. It'd be much, much oh. further north. <laughs> You know, just at the top of Kilmer Crennan, as you get to the top of it and you're turning out, you'd have turned right at that point. You wouldn't have gone that far. You wouldn't have gone as far as the lagoon or anywhere like that. No, you wouldn't have gone that far. Okay, fascinating uh, yeah. stuff. Right, I mean, St. Michael's uh, in uh, Creesla has, has always had huge significance in, in history as well, uh, but never more so now. Um, and, and I don't know how it will be. Uh, Joe, maybe you can help me with this, how it will be reflected on in, in history because it's been the scene of so much devastation with so many funerals, but then the scene of so much unity um, and then something we haven't seen for some time, uh, how maybe the spiritual element of life came to, to people's rescue in some cases, or not for everyone's. It's really almost like an epicenter of something. I can't quite yes. put my words on it. Absolutely, and, and I have to say myself in my own personal capacity, like, I've had the privilege of being there on numerous nights with the people of Crisa when they were praying the rules we led by Father John, John Doe and others. And, you know, this is cross-community. There are other traditions there as well, religious traditions within Crisa, uh, a great healthy respect and understanding between uh, the faiths, and that's terribly, terribly important to say. But, look, the, the church itself, it's, it's a beautiful church, um, it's a very unusual church. It was built in 19, opened in 1971 and is one of the famous churches of Liam McCormick. He, he designed, I think, seven churches in Donegal. I don't and, suppose Killy Mard was one of his, was it? Because it's also, I don't know, I, I'm not putting you on the spot there, but there are a couple of architecturally interesting churches around the county. Yeah, well, Milford and Murlog, uh, uh, Desert Hagney, Burt, um, these were some of the places he built, uh, Glentis, and he built the Dolmore Presbyterian Church in 1977, and it was the Chrysler one he built in 1971, so there's seven churches that were designed by him, or he was the architect for them, so to answer your question, I'm not 100% wonder sure. wonder what the reaction would have been to something that's not incredibly traditional, I suppose, in, a, in a, an architectural uh, context. Yeah, you see, Vatican II, it happened in the 60s, which tried to get the church to modernize. And most churches were, were crucifix formed. That was the shape. Mm. Uh, the two aisles, like the shape of the cross, and then the aisle went up the center. Um, as for the modern architecture post Vatican II, um, tried to be more in keeping with the people and with what, what was maybe relevant historically to the place. So, for example, the St. Michael's Church is, is shaped, and if you stand back and look at it, it's shaped like muckish, and it has that curve and that roundness. And roundness. The beautiful one in Burt is like a boat, uh, and Colum Killer, that idea of the boat, and it's very, very well designed. And so um, the, the old church, the old Doe Chapel, as it was known, um, was was the oldest chapel in, in, in the diocese in its time in 1752. And again, I mentioned William Ray of Ards, who was a landlord there. And this is before Catholic emancipation. He um, granted the land for the, the chapel in Doe to be built. And it was renovated in the 1830s and it was extended and so on and so forth. But then on the morning of uh, August 15th, uh, 1971, the last mass was said there in what was then Doe Chapel. And where has, uh, has St. Michael's sort of consumed Doe? Was Doe uh, yes. Chapel knocked down or what's the story? Subsequently then it was, yeah. Uh, hmm. And there's still some of it left. And the bell tower that, that was built there in 1918 by the, the, the coils, that's still there and intact. And the graveyard is there. People still you know, use the graveyard. 
But um, Doe Do itself has a great history, uh, the Doe Chapel. Um, it, it, for example, uh, you had Father McFadden in your door, I am the law in your door, um, Michael David and himself and the local parish priest, Father Kelly, they came there in January 1888 and the RIC, there was a massive crowd there, it was a plan of campaign where they were trying to take on the landlords and get their rent lowered. And Father McFadden took to the stage in front of a large, large crowd. Mm. I imagine it was thousands of people, but the RIC were noting what he was saying. And he said, I am the law in your door. What a thing for, for someone to say. But uh, he was I like it. I like yeah, it. There's a title of a book in that. And uh, he was subsequently jailed for that statement because that was seen as inciting people to riot. Uh, both himself and Father Stevens and Claude Neely, both of them were later, later jailed uh, for that. Um, so, uh, and then beside that, there's a, a place called Medal Hill. It's part of the Ards Trail Walk. It's a canonical kind of little hill. And Father Theobald Matthew, he was the temperance um, priest. He was a capuchin, and he went round the the country trying to get men and women to take the pledge because you know drink was 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 driving people to madness uh, at that time and potching. And um, so we had a monster meeting there, a massive, massive meeting there in. Uh, it's called Metal Hill in there just beside Doe. And it was not just for Catholics, it was Protestants. All traditions were there. Uh, and they took the pledge. Many of the men at the time um, took the pledge that they would they would abstain from alcohol. So that's Metal Hill. So that I wonder of... how far a geographical area he might have drew people to that meeting from. Oh, that's a very good question. Well, it, from what I understand, what I've read from it, it's uh, he would have taken them from Duhuri, which was quite a distance, mm. uh, right over... To let her Kenny, so that whole area, uh, Medal Hill, and the whole idea of temperance, and and again uh, having balance in your life, and and, and uh, that's what he was looking for. And supposedly there's a story that he cured some girl. She was in crutches and couldn't walk, and she had to cross over from the other side of the road to get to where he was. And uh, he said that was a struggle for you, and she says, yeah, but you could, you know, you can do anything. And seemingly he blessed her. And yeah. So that's local folk or that, and that she she left the crutches behind and she was able to walk. And I suppose while we're in this area, uh, at the church at Ballymore. Um... Yeah. Well, you would you would know the courthouse from your time of reporting in the county council there in in Lefford. and the design on the courthouse it's it's late uh, uh, Victorian uh, or sorry, Georgian architecture. And uh, St. John's in Ballymore is a lovely design church. If you look at the windows on it, it's very similar to the courthouse. It's the same architect as, as uh, in, in Lefford Courthouse and, and St. John's. It was built in 1752. And interestingly, the bell in, the, uh, the, in St. John's was a bell that was taken out of Dunluwe Church, the, the Protestant church in Dunluwe. It's sitting there. And beside the, the lovely, uh, this lovely church is a tunnel um, built by Stuart. He later became the landlord in AGR Stuart in Ards, mm -hmm. Ards, Ards Friary. And his wife was... Isabella Toller, he married uh, this woman by the name of Isabella Toller. Her grandfather was known as a hanging judge. It was he that uh, hung, uh, that had um, Robert Emmett executed. And he used to fall asleep during the court cases, they, they say, and he wasn't very fair and very, very honourable man from, from historical accounts. But uh, that was Toller, the hanging judge, as he was wow. called. Okay, um, so... There's a long tunnel and it's still there to be seen that went from uh, Ballymore Church. It's on the main road, if you look at it. Some of it was taken away in the 70s by the county council. They didn't do a very good job of it because I think they aesthetically disturbed the balance of it. And that went down into Ards. Uh, it would be lovely to see that being restored. How far is that tunnel? How What distance is it? I wonder. Oh, I mean, and just from memory, it's a bit, it used to be a lot longer. Yeah. Uh, it's maybe about 60 feet now, but it was okay. a lot longer. And there were stables there as well beside it. So for the road widening, I think they should have widened the road on the other side. Mm, come but they, anyway, look, it is what it is. It is. And lovely yeah. stone, stone and, 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 and it, yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk about ours, but then we'll, we'll talk about Loch Salt Road first, because it's a fascinating road, and it used to be the road into Creesla, effectively, via Glen and over the bridge and, 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 and then on into to Creesla. Yeah, yeah. What, uh, well, what was it... Like I mean, we know who built it, don't we? It was uh, yeah. it was William uh, William Ray. To yeah. what end? Why why did he build it? And did he build it? Uh, did it sort of go from? What do you tell us? What part did he actually build? Well, build? He, seemed, he seemed to be again when we talk about landlords, one has to be careful, and there's a tendency of us and them, and they were all bad, and and that wasn't the case. 
and there were some very generous, good uh, landlords. Um, William Hamilton up there in Donegal Town, a recklessly generous landlord. There's a book about him. You know, there were good landlords as well. And William Ray seemed to have been a fairly good landlord. And one of his endeavours was to build roads and infrastructure. That seemed to be a hobby of his. Um, and maybe at that time, it would have been a lot less financially burdening to get more road done than we would have to pay for now for a small um, bit of road with safety plans and traffic management. There would have been none of that. And uh, he, he, he realised that where he was in Ards was very remote. And there was no road through Crista as we know now. The M56 didn't exist. So um, he, he decided, well, we need to build a road. And th the best way to build a road is a straight road. And if you see some of the old roads in Donegal, they're often straight. Um, but the problem with that is that meant they had to go up mountains, and that was difficult for animals. So he built a uh, lost salt with the with the idea of opening up uh, Priestley, Dunfanaghy, that area, to Letter Kenny. Uh, and so he has had a scheme in place, and he got each tenant to take on a responsibility for a small portion of the road. And over time, then it was built, and that used to be the main way into Priestley the main road, until the new road was built in 1837. And believe it or not, it's only in the last 10 years the Cheerland Road, actually the bends were taken out of it, and it was fixed by the Donegal County Council. A fabulous job now. So, uh, but uh, William Ray was the head of the head of the County Council way, way back. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating road. It is very, very straight for much of it as it go past the, the, the waterworks there. And then I presume it would have required some blasting or whatever, because there's some kind of, particularly around the lakes, there's some kind of interesting rock formations that don't look quite natural. And I've often thought if there was different routes considered or if this was done via, via blasting or or something, you know, sometimes something looks like nature and then something looks like there was some. Uh, but I suppose it's arguable whether or not that's the deepest lake in Ireland, as far as I'm aware. We'll not get into that today. Uh, but brave enough, I suppose, to, to skirt it with a road. Yeah, and it was... It, it, Bishop Pocock, he came to Ireland. He, he later became Bishop of Meath, uh, but he was from England, and he did a lot of tours, Egypt, Scotland, England. And he came to um, Ireland, and he did anti-clock. He started in Dublin, went to Belfast and across, and he came into Donegal, and he actually wrote in his diary in, in uh, 1752 about this road and how it was made and how well it was made. So obviously there was, you're talking about rock, uh, obviously there was a design to the road that William Ray would have seen been fulfilled and he talked about how good this road was and he actually ended up going and visiting William Ray and going and visiting the Stuarts and Hornhead so uh, a very very interesting and he talked there was one beautiful thing that that he talked about was the amphitheater he could see the vestments in the distance um, and a priest saying mass and hundreds of people gathered round so it was obviously a mass rock and he said that the papers were too poor to have a, a church and maybe that's what inspired William Ray to give the land at Doe Subsequently, about 30 years later, the church was built after Pocock's visit to Ray. Um, so maybe he granted some land, maybe they had a discussion. Mm. Um, but again, you're very correct in talking about the Lost Salt Road, and he had, he had a lot to do with that. But this yes. William Ray was an eccentric kind of fellow. He went, he threatened uh, his neighbour, another another landlord, uh, Stuart in Hornhead, who was maybe 70 at the time, and Ray would have been a young man in his 30s, to a duel at the top of Muckish. Uh, his honour had been disrespected, but uh, they managed Still to... goes on every weekend, I would say. Yeah. Well, they want... <laughs> he wrote him a note saying, I want this done in secret and my honour must be restored. Um, but look, uh, they, they ended up resolving the matter quite amicably and all good relations were, were, uh, were, were restored. But unfortunately, because of his roads and his um, expenditure, he, he went into debt and he had to end up selling arts. So that's how the Stuarts... Right, because I've kind of jumped over Ards a little bit. So what yeah. did William Ray establish at Ards? What was his Ards? Well, his Ards was he built the original part of the house. Right. Now, that would have been the initial and the road into it. That would have been... He was a man that loved entertaining. He loved people. Um, yeah, he was a kind of a very eccentric kind of individual, maybe a little bit on his own, but uh, a very good insofar as trying to develop the local economy and open up, as we talked about the road, trying to develop it a little bit. Um, and very, he was a celebrated figure, eccentric, um, autocratic, kind and generous. That was his epitaph someone had written about him. But he, he ran into debt and he had to sell it to Alexander Stewart from Derry in um, 1782. And they extended the house and they put the wall around it. They built what we 
well, we wouldn't remember now that the old house that was there was subsequently knocked down, but there's some remnants of it there in the orchard. Um, and um, he, he uh, his granddaughter then inherited the house um, after his time, and she had married a man from um, from South Africa, so it became known as the Stuart Bam Estate. And then after their time then, this, they, it was the War of Independence, Civil War, all that had happened, uh, happened, and so the state then sold, uh, the Stuart Bam stole the, sold the estate to the Irish Free State um, in about 1926, around that time. And the Land Commission then divided Ards, that estate, in two. So um, the forestry, the Department of Lands and Forestry got one half, which is the walkway in the forest are now today. And then the other half was given to the Franc uh, the Capuchins. Why, uh, so would the, why would that have happened? I mean, is there a, a spiritual connection that predates this? Or would they have said, look, there's a nice spot of land up here. We think we can do something really nice with it. I mean, what would kind of horse trading goes on? Uh, well, early last century to, to sort this out? You have two questions in one, so I'll come to the to, the, to both of them. Maybe you've asked a great question. The first thing is, the, when Ireland got independence, there were a lot of uh, gentry houses available, um, and many of them were sold for convents. Um, and in this case, this house was available. Uh, Bally Connell and Fulcara was available. That was given to the Loretto Order to create a, a, a teaching college. And Ard was available and given to the, um, the Capuchins uh, to do as they wish with it for students. Um, and uh, eventually they, they built a new, which is the Ards we know today, in 1966. It was opened a new church and a new um, dormitory and uh, living area that's still there. Um, and actually over, over the years there was a seminary there, a Franciscan or Capuchin Franciscan seminary there. Um, over, over 200 students would have studied in it over the years from the 60s on. Uh, all over the world, those those um, Capuchins, uh, some of them we would know still that would be in Ards, would have spent time there. So that was given to the the Capuchins, sorry, of the Order of St. Francis for the purposes of education and for spiritual purposes. The other half was given to the um, to the forestation, probably to maintain it and to look after, because there are quite some quite unusual trees that the Stuarts would have built during uh, their time, or trees that they would have planted, and some of the um, walkways that they would have built, etc., to maintain all that it would probably mean too much for the for the Capuchins to do. But you you asked a, a very interesting question: Was there some spiritual tradition here? There actually was, uh, and the spiritual capital of 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 Clondaharkey, like that's Creesta and Dunfanaghy, would traditionally have been in Creesta beside Doe Castle. And in 1860, Ruri Maxevnia of Doe he um, granted lands for the friars, the third order regular Franciscans. And so there was actually um, a friary there, um, a church and place for living and uh, the different rooms that we required going back to the 1460s. So there's been a long, long tradition in Cristo of spiritual formation and particularly with the Franciscans, now with the Cap Capuchins. Um, and that carried on down to the plantation, probably about 1609 when you know, Henry VIII and the dis um, disillusionment of the church and then the plantation of, of Ulster, that would have been all closed down. But certainly there is a strong, long tradition of, of spirituality with the religious orders mm. increased itself. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and you mentioned Doe Castle. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I think if I were to say, you know, Marble Hill and ask someone to say a word they're, they're after, they'd go Marble Hill Beach. It's very well known, uh, often visited maybe people may not be as aware of Marble Hill House. Well, it? Marble Hill House is a pretty famous house. It was belonged to... Um, Fra Francis Law was, a, was the last man. He sold it off, Francis Law, but it belonged to Hugh Law, who was a T TD for Donegal. He was an MP previous to that there, um, and a very light man. Uh, he then stood in, later on as a, as a TD for Clan Neil and was elected. Uh, in the late 20s, but he, he was a very uh, open man, loved entertaining, and he brought m numerous people to the area. Like you had Chesterton, you had uh, Percy French, you had Cousins, you had A.E. Russell, different people like that. Jack B. Yates, 
Uh, William Butler Yeats's brother, who won the Olympic medal for, for art in 1924, people maybe didn't know that, and, uh, and he said, anywhere I, I, I take out my easel, this was in Marble Hill, I see a picture. So um, he, he, could, he could see beauty in, in the area of, of Marble Hill. So he was a... a, a, a Boner was a uh, was um, no sorry, my apologies. Um, Law was a uh, was a um, MP, and his father actually, interestingly enough, was uh, the Lord Chancellor to Ireland, and he was with Lord Cavendish the day he was murdered, the Phoenix Park murders, and he offered him a lift. He, they were just leaving a meeting from the what now is Aris and Uchtaran, the Vicar Lodge. He offered him a lift, and he didn't want. He said he'd walk, and he walked to his death in the sense that he, he was murdered. And it was Law's father that offered him that lift that day. But the Laws were there, and, and that house was subsequently sold. But there's a lot, a lot of famous people that would have visited that house and have, would have come there. And what's and its it, current function? Is it a private property? Is it a uh... private property there now. But interesting enough, uh, Patrick Pierce came there at one time. He came in, in the 27th of August, 1906, specifically to come. He landed at the train station mm. in Creaseland. And he went down to Law's. Law wasn't there himself at the time. And there was a big celebration there. Uh, and he learned the fairy reel there. He seemingly never had seen it before. And they, they'd shown him how to dance the fairy reel. So Patrick Pierce would have come to Priestland and would have spent some time there. And then the following day then after that, he went to, to Doe Castle, the famous Doe Castle. Yeah. yeah. And you talk of Doe Castle. It's a small jaunt to it. And it, it is. It is. It's, it's just full of history. Yes. Uh, well, Doe Castle is, is probably an icon of, of symbols for, for Northwest Donegal. Um, again, uh, there's been you know, some monies have been put into it in recent times, and it's been beautifully, you know, restored. Um, and it, it, it's a, it looks actually originally the way it's plastered or its original color would have had that color, kind of white color initially, and it had fallen into disrepair for quite some time. But it belonged to the next Sweeney's uh, Dua, the Sweeney's of Doe. Um, and uh, they had been there for quite some time. Um, and from 1570 to 1596, the chief was Owen Og. Um, and he, he, in the four annals of the four masters, um, they talk about this Owen Og. Max Sevigny was an influential and generous, um, gifted of good counsel in peace and war. Uh, and it was he that took Red Hugh O'Donnell in Foster. So Red Hugh O'Donnell was sent to him to be reared. And we know then what happened with Mullen, with Red Hugh being captured uh, uh, by the English mm -hmm. after the Nine Years' War and subsequently. And obviously then the, the failure of the Irish in the end and the plantation of Ulster. But then the second thing about Doe Castle is then in 1580, or 50, 1652, my apologies, 1642, sorry, a Spanish frigate came into Doe Castle, manned by Owen Rua O'Neill, so one of the people that had left on the flight of the Earls came back with a hundred Irish men that had been in the Spanish army to begin the eighteen uh, or the sorry the, the 1642 rebellion. That's where it began. It began in, in Doe Castle wow. when he arrived in there. The St. Francis was the name of the boat. Um, and uh, subsequently then it belonged to uh, George Vaughan Hart uh, in the 19th century before it was bought by the Land Commission in 1922. So um, it's a very, very famous, famous castle, yeah. All right. So, okay, we're coming to the end of our time, um, Joe. Uh, but let's stay with the castle then. And um, you talked about the history, the tangible, but every castle has its ghostly legend, doesn't it? Ah, yeah, and, and Doe is no different. Um, Ke Kevin McAward, he's a, he's a former uh, retired uh, National School principal of Priesta School, National School, has written a lovely book about Doe Castle, uh, and in it, he tells a story about uh, the, the famous love between Aileen Maxevnia, Aileen Maxevnia, and Turla Og O'Boyle. There's a castle in Port Nebla uh, called the O'Boyle. It's still there, um, and it would have been used by the Rays before they built Ards. But uh, the family that owned that were the O'Boyles, and he was Turla Og was madly in love with Aileen. But Mil Wara Maxevnia of Doe was having none of it. And uh, Neil McIlwraithia, who you mentioned, the, the uh, poet from Crease, that wrote a lovely poem in English, and I'll just maybe read two verses, verses of it. In Don Tallywood, as best he could, his love for her he vowed, but her father, overhearing him, chastised O'Boyle aloud. 
In haughty pride, he says, abiding for her by the sea, but you'll never wed the daughter of Milwara and Vata Bui. So he wasn't going to have any of Turla Og O'Boyle's advances on his daughter Eileen. And so seemingly he was captured by Milmora and taken as prisoner and put into a dungeon in Doe Castle. And on seeing Turla Og's body coming out, it was wrapped in a, in a sheet. Eileen was in the tower. She uh, took fright and she, uh, in the moment of madness, she jumped out off the tower. She couldn't um, handle the fact that her, her love was no more. Mm. She fell to her death. And uh, she, both of them were buried in the, in, in the graveyard just next to Doe Castle. And, and, the, and there believes that there's a boat on, there's believe there's a boat on Yaka uh, still there at the bridge. You'll see a boat at night time with two people in it. And as the verse goes, and fishers say, Along the beach, a phantom boat is seen to gently glide by pale moonlight adown by lack of stream. While in that boat, two figures float and on each face a smile to say it is young Aileen and her Turla Ogo boy. Ah, so, oh, it make, you, make the hair stand uh, on end. Okay. So hopefully uh, in they were united. Okay, listen, um, there's so much more time we could have dedicated to this but i think it's so important just to, to talk about what is a a most uh, beautiful area in the first poem that you read quite rightly points out just the most beautiful uh, area um dr joe kelly thank you so much for joining us for this uh talking history extra podcast i suppose you could say yes yeah, so and again to the memory of the people that have died in Krista and to the honour of those that have injured and to the honour of the community. Uh, I hope that, you know, the light shining, the spot of the world has been on Krista, but Krista has a very rich history, culture, heritage, faith, all those wonderful, wonderful things. And I have no doubt that in this present time, it is all those rich things that they're rooted in that will help them be restored. And please, God, when, when things are assigned to history in time to come, all the positives will be remembered and the sadness will dissipate over time.